healing hand For every prisoner you're delivering For every lost soul you're the promised land I'll break through Your I'll break through Out of the ashes you make beautiful Well, good morning, church. Good morning to you that are joining us online this morning. Thank you for tuning in. Well, God is good. We've been singing about that and His faithfulness. Thank you, Tammy, for being faithful to what God laid on your heart because that ties into what I'm going to share this morning. Father God, we just come to you and we thank you 
Father, for your presence with us, we thank you for your guidance and your direction. We thank you for your holy scriptures. Lord, that are a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. They're a guide for us today into the future. We ask you for your Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to quicken us, to help us to understand, and to change us where we need to change. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was thinking about what I'm going to share this morning, a thought came to my mind. In the old cowboy days, where they're out in the country and there were tr railroad tracks, and they were planning to attack the train, what they would do is just wondering to know if the train was coming, they put their ear to the track to hear what, if the vibrations that were down the track, if it was coming or not. And the Lord just said to me, that's what I want the church to do. I want them to put their ear to the ground to hear and sense what is coming. This morning, I'm going to talk about the purpose of the church in light of the final countdown. Vivek has been sharing on Tuesday nights an admiral, awesome job on the end time situation. And if you remember a chart that he gave us, from the time of Christ to the end is the church age. That's the time that we are in right now, and the church is going to be the vehicle that is going to usher in the end times. You and I are that church. And so we need to know the day and the hour we're living in. We need to know what's coming down the tube. We cannot bury our heads in the sand any longer. We need to rise up and say, God, I need to hear what your spirit is saying. What I felt in my spirit this morning was this, as, as maybe unpleasant as it might be, it's we will not be returning to normal because God is moving forward. And if there's anything that's going to be normal, it's going to be what he wants. And we need to make sure that we do not want to go back because there is no going back. God is a God of the future. God is progressing and God is going forward and we need to be in lockstep with him. Amen? It's burning in my spirit this morning. The church age, the 2,000 year gap from Christ to the end is where the church is functioning and needs to be functioning under the anointing of the Holy Spirit because it's the church that's going to be part of God's plan to usher in the great harvest at the end. Through signs and wonders and the power and authority. There is rhetoric that we are hearing through governments around the world. Coming out of the mouths of politicians, there's a word that's being used. And it's a very descriptive word, and it's a word that is telling of what's coming. And it's the word, the Great Reset, which is moving toward a globalist control, or as we have known, a one world system. They're talking about it now globally. We got to listen to what the Spirit is saying. We need to listen and know, not in, and, and become fearful, but become aware as a church. Time where the church becomes, well, let me put it this way. As the world is talking about a great reset, we as a church need to have a great reset. There needs to be a reset in our minds, in our hearts, in our understanding of God's Word. That's why I say we will not return to normal because I believe God is moving by His Holy Spirit to challenge the church today to move forward, to get out of our comfort zones, to step out of the book, to step out of the box. I'm challenged with that myself, church, I'll tell you. To move out of our comfort zones, that carefulness, that apathy, and just saying, I'm just content to come to church, read my Bible, pray, and that's it. It's time, the reset that God wants to do in the church today, the purpose of the church. He wants us to become that God force, that God force that will 
usher in the final countdown. We read in Matthew 24 what's going to happen globally. Revelation reveals what's going to happen globally by God. God's got a plan too. And these things are all part of the, of the lead into the end, the church's role. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, the purpose of the church. You and I are the church. I've said it again, over and over, wherever I've gone. The church is not the corporate gathering. The church is you and me. So when he talks about the church, he's talking about me. Church, you go into all the world. He's talking about me. He's talking about you. We've got to get that perspective. All this is happening, and all that we're hearing around us, and I appreciate Tammy's challenge this morning. Let's get out of the ditch, basically. Let's pull ourselves out of the ditch, and let's get back on track. Because what should be happening to us when we see and hear, it should be having a positive effect on us, because what we begin to see is God at work. God's on the throne. God's in control. And there's where our focus and our faith needs to be. A word that, as I was studying, came to me, one word, prepare. Prepare. How many have ever played hide and seek? There's a countdown, isn't there? There's a countdown. And what happens at the end of the countdown? What do you say? Ready or not, here I come. We're in a countdown, church, and God is going to say at the end, ready or not, here I come. And we need to be ready, church, not just ready in ourselves personally, that bride, and, the bride without spot and wrinkle. Yes, that's part of it. But also, we got to make sure other people are ready. we got to begin to think bigger. We need to begin to think wider. We need to begin to think deeper in the things of God. Amen? The Great Reset. What is it? The World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, generally suggests that a globalized world is best managed by a self-selected coalition of multinational corporations, governments, and civil society. This is their, this is their agenda. It seems periods of global instability, such as the financial crisis we're in, the COVID pandemic, are windows of opportunity to intensify it's pro pro programmatic efforts. Let's listen. Let's find out what's happening. Let's not bury our heads in the sand. This is their heart. Some critics hence see the Great Reset as a continuation of the World Economic Forum strategy of focusing on connotated activist topics such as environmental protection. You hear a lot about that, don't we? And social entrepreneurship to disguise the organization's alleged true plut pluton plutographic goals. And that means simply a society that is ruled or controlled by people of great wealth and income. I wanted to give you a little background in the world we're living in, in the time we're living in. Matthew 28, 18, the purpose of the church in all of this. How do we function? How do we flow? What is God doing with us, the church? How do we live in this kind of environment? There is a countdown happening. And let's make sure we're participating. Matthew 28, 18, 19. It's a great commission. We know it out of the Message Bible. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge to the church, to the disciples at that day. You and I are his disciples. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Read this personally now. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by the baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this day after day after day. Right up unto the end. The final countdown. The end. We've got to be doing this, church. We need God's wisdom. We need His direction. We need the Holy Spirit. Help us. What does that look like? We all have our world. We all have people in our world. All, each of us, our world looks different. 
When Christ came, he brought an eternal message, the gospel, the good news. When Jesus Christ returned to the Father, something else amazing began based on what he taught on his three and a half years on earth. He laid a foundation that would be built upon. And that foundation was the revelation that he was Christ, the Son of the living God. And that is what the church is to be built upon, that foundation. We know that this is like Christianity 101. We know that. But we can forget it sometimes. We can kind of lose sight of that. We kind of lose the impact of that. What does that really mean? My life needs to be built upon Jesus the rock, upon the Word of God. So God created a new community known as His church, the body of Christ, which each of us are part of. He commissioned us to carry on the good news of salvation, carry on the message of the kingdom, called by the Holy Spirit, redeemed by His grace, fallible human beings, you and I became co-workers. Think about that. God the Creator has allowed us through His Son, Jesus Christ, to become come alongside of Him and be co-workers in walking out His plan for this world. You know what that does to you? That it humbles me but it also puts a great responsibility on my shoulders. Lord, I need to be faithful. I need to keep my hand to the plow. I need to be looking forward. I need to be in lockstep with you. Co-workers with him, experiencing and spreading the message of the hope. I want you to put that. It's up there already. I want you to read this with me. I like Carson and I grew up in a church. We did a lot of public reading. Because not only are you Seeing it, you're seeing it, and you're hearing it. The church, let's read it together. The church universal is God's vehicle on earth to declare and display and promote on his behalf the glories, which are the benefits, advantages of his eternal kingdom. That's who we are. We're his vehicle. We are, I like to put it this way as well. We're the conduit, stuff flown from heaven into us and out from us. We're the pipeline. We're the channels of kingdom vision, kingdom values, kingdom culture to a lost world. Every day should bring us one step closer, prepared for the wrap-up of time. So every day should challenge us to evaluate our faith levels. And that's the key. Where is my faith level in God? Do I really believe Him? Do I really know the Word? Am I living out the Word? Am I applying the Word? Is that my value system? Should challenge us. Because this will be the essential key to becoming the bride without spot and wrinkle and motivation to fulfill His design for us, the church. So what's involved in the church reset? What is He trying to do? What is he doing by the Holy Spirit? How are we responding to what he is doing? As I said, he's progressive. He's moving forward. He's revealing. He's bringing revelation. He's bringing understanding. Are we in lockstep with what God's great plan is? I'm going to give you three simple keys, three words, the purpose, the plan, as we heard this morning, and the process. Three Ps. All right that we need to make sure we are walking in understanding and li letting Him live, help us to live those things out in our lives. The purpose. We need to understand God's purpose. Not our purpose, not man's purpose, not government's purpose, not financial institution purpose, not what the World Economic Forum purpose is. We need to know what God's purpose is. Because if we don't, then we can get confused. We can be inundated. We can be programmed. We can be programmed. We can be... What's another word? Throw one another word at me if we're not understanding. Who? Conformed. That's right. That's a good one. Influenced. Manipulated. Molded. Shapen. By that out there. If we don't understand God's purpose for the church, what was his initial plan? 
Why did he design us? Why did he send out the disciples and say what he said in Matthew 28? His purpose is simply this. All that he is doing is that all men might be saved. That's the heart of God, for God so loved the world that he gave. We must never forget that. That God's plan is that all men, all women, everyone, come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's it. Let's not encumber ourselves. Let's not confuse ourselves. Let's not overload us with all kinds of other things. A lot of things work in that, that, that purpose drive. But let us make sure to, for us to understand why we're here. To be ready, but to make sure others are ready as well. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. We heard the word judgment. We got to, I think Carson mentioned it. Stay away from judgment. Let God be the judge. Because if we're looking on the outward, God's looking on the heart. We look on the outward, it's very easy to write people off. That's purpose in 1 Timothy 2, 3, 4 is what I call is the kingdom vision. We've got to have that vision. That's the kingdom vision. That was in the heart and mind of God when he sent Jesus to be reunited with his creation forever. God is a God that's unprejudiced, unbiased, and non-discriminatory. <clears throat> That's the heart of God. Our human heart would go the opposite of all those. That's why he said, put to death these things that are members. Put on Christ. Every race, every color, class, rich and poor, educated, uneducated, weak and strong, healthy and unhealthy, male and female, those who struggle with gender identity, politicians, young and old, are who God sent his son to die for. Amen? So when we see and hear what people are doing, and man, we can get angry and we can get frustrated. Yes, we should get angry, but we don't need to be frustrated. But you know, we need to make sure we direct our anger in the right direction. We got to be angry and even hateful to the devil. That's the influence right there. Mr. Trudeau is influenced by the devil. Let's not get angry at him. Let's get angry at the devil. Let's pray for him. Pray for our governments. Amen. That's our role as a church. He laid it all out there. It's in there. Read it. Church, pray. This desire all to be saved reveals the unconditional love that overlooks the human frailties that we might look at and use to select who we think should come into the kingdom of God. We need God's vision in order to understand our role in why we are His church. God's kingdom is eternal. We need to have an eternal perspective. That's what's been ringing in my heart. Lord, give me an eternal perspective. How you look at things, I need to look at things the same way. Help me. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Here's where we're going to learn. Illuminated by the Holy Spirit, we will learn that heavenly perspective. The kingdom of God, Luke 17, 24, won't read it, but he says the kingdom of God is in you. We talk about having a kingdom vision. Where must it be? It must be in us. That's where the kingdom of God is. In our hearts to be displayed to the world. That's the purpose. What's the plan? What's God's plan in, in, in uh, the purpose of the church? How is that going to unfold? What is he going to do to achieve his purpose? Ephesians 1, 20 to 23. Out of the Message Bible, all this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from death and set him on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe. Everything from from galaxies to governments, no name and no power exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all and has the final word on everything. Amen. 
Do we believe that? At the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not on, uh, on the edges, not, he puts it, not peripheral to the world or on the edge of the world. The world is peripheral to the church, meaning it should be on the edge of the church. The church should be dominant. Oh, Lord, am I dominant in my world? Or am I tending to be on the edge? Stay away from the world. Yes, come out from among them and be separate. Don't get involved. But at the same time, go you into all the world and preach the gospel. So how dominant am I in my world? What do people see? What do they sense? What do they feel? Am I going to criticize or am I going to encourage? The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. Though through you and I, the church, that vehicle on earth to demonstrate the kingdom of God to the world. The body, the church, I'm just going to kind of relate to scriptures here. The body, the church of living God, a place where he dwells on earth in order to reveal to the world his glory. The manifest presence of God. That's what he wants to do through you and I. Are we manifesting his presence? So the plan involves kingdom value. The purpose involves kingdom vision. The plan involves kingdom, uh, let's say, kingdom values or principles that govern our lives. What principles are governing your lives? Is this the value system that's governing your lives or is it social media that's governing your life? It requires some deep introspection because this deals with kingdom values or principles that are to govern our lives. Kingdom vision is about how we see ourselves or our roles. Kingdom values shape our character that affect our actions. He takes sinful carnal people like you and me and does a miracle of making new creatures. Old things pass away, behold, all things become new. We can't do that on our own, but we do it by, by, by submitting, humbling ourselves to the work of the Lord by His Word and by His Spirit. And He changes us. And we begin to see, the, James says it's like the Word is like a mirror. We begin to reflect back to us. Oh, I don't look like that. Wow, is that how ugly I look in the mirror? Boy, I better make some changes as I go out in the world today. He takes sinful carnal like you and me, changes us. Romans 12, 2. We know this scripture very well, but it's apropos to read it this morning. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Philip's translation says, don't let the world force you into its mold. What's molding you? What's shaping you? Social media? The news? Oh, my goodness. What are you going to allow? What are you taking in? It will affect you. Thank you for being here this morning. You're taking in, hopefully, the Word of God that you're hearing by the Holy Spirit. I pray it will shape you. That's what we need in us constantly is the Word of God molding us and shaping us. And, and as the Scripture says here, it, 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 it's, it's renewing us, our minds. Mind's a seat of our intellect. Whatever we're taking in here affects our actions. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Mind renewal through the Word reveals a different value system by which we need to live. In this world, but not part of it. We are to be His representatives, His ambassadors. Listen to 2 Corinthians 16, uh, verse 16 to 20 out of the message. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We look at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone, a new life emerges. Look at it. All this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him, and then called us to settle our relationship with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah. 
giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking, of, we're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God because he's already a friend with you. Powerful. Establishes within us his kingdom values. In us, the church, that become the foundation of what we are. Carson said this morning, we've got to do church. We do church by being the church. It's not about doing, it's about being. But when you're being, you will do. Whatever you're taking in, whatever's molding you, whatever's shaping you, is going to help you. So as we embrace this thought, what is my purpose? How am I going to get there? Through the Word. That's His plan, to mold us and shape us. The church's mandate is to go into all the world, as we already read. It goes, and it goes through a life process of birth to maturity to develop into a powerful church in the sense of influence for righteousness wherever it is. We are in that place right now, that church age, where we have been born into the kingdom. Now he wants us to mature. That doesn't mean we just become like senior citizens. We mature in ability. We mature in experience. We mature in understanding the Word. We mature by walking after the Spirit. We mature by functioning in the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit. That's the maturity. And that's necessary to, to, be, to display the kingdom of God to the world. In the book of Acts, we have the church beginning and becoming what God had in mind. We have God's model for us here to follow. The church in the book of Acts was a powerful church. A lot lost, a lot became lost, but God is restoring the church before the end. We are in that restoration days, church, where he's molding us and shaping us and filling us with his Holy Spirit. Who we are to be, how we are to live, and what we are to do, walking in the purpose he had in mind for us, the church, the ecclesia. We're to, we are the called out ones from the world. We're the set in ones into the body of Christ. And we are to be the sent out ones, go and fulfill the commission that was in the heart and mind of God. It is to be more than just a place where it provides a maintenance mode concept. We come to church, we go home, we've done our religious duty for the week, we pray, we, we, we read a Bible. That's, I call that maintenance mode. We're just maintaining. Children of Israel were 40 years in a maintenance mode and then they died off and never really entered in the fullness of what God had for them. Let us never come to that place in our own personal lives where I just maintain, I'm holding on, I'm hanging in there, baby, till Jesus comes. Well, you know, you can do that, but you're going to miss out on a lot of rewards because we're rewarded for what we do for Christ while we're here on earth. More, it's to be more than just a place where it provides a maintenance mode concept, but a place of the church is to be a place of movement, action, purpose, and vision, equipping each other for the works of ministry, fivefold ministry. Ephesians 4, 11, fivefold given for the equipping of the saints for work of ministry. Tammy said, let's get ourselves out of the ditches because there's work of ministry to do. If we get caught up in this, woe is me and all that's happening, we're going to miss out and not do what God's called us to do. In changing times, standards, values, convictions, that's all that's happening, right? Man, it, the world's going nuts. Values changing all over the place. And, you know, that, that can affect us by circumstances, situations, relationships, man's own sinful, selfish nature. The church, with all these changes happening, I mean, like I said, the world's gone nuts and values. The church must be the source of stability in this unstable world, providing answers and radiating hope based upon the absolutes of God's Word. We're losing that, church. We're losing the absolutes. We, the church, need to let the world know there are some absolutes that are good absolutes. You might not like them, the devil doesn't like them, and he's sowing that, those seeds of lies and doubts, and people doubt God's not the way. He's old-fashioned. No, those are absolutes that are established to last for eternity. And if we are anchored in those, those values, then we will 
be established for eternity as well. Sometimes we can get caught up in the moment with all that is happening and not realize that things are playing out just as God has planned. Do you believe that? <laughs> all that's happening in the world today, God knows. He knew it was coming. It's all part of his plan. God, would you allow that to happen? He, he, he said to man, take care of this world. That's your will. If you don't, you'll be cursed. If you obey me, you'll be blessed. So, you know, it's, it's not his fault. It's man's fault. But he knew it was going to happen. He's, he is God. He's on the throne and in control. There's nothing to fear because at the back of the book says he wins and we win. We are to be the messengers with a message of eternal hope. Can I read you something? I came across this morning on Facebook, on social media. Hopefully it's discernment that has caused me to pull this up. Led by the Holy Spirit. It's written by a pastor, Mikola Romanek, in the Ukraine right now. The head pastor of the Urban Bible Church in Ukraine. It says, according to Ecclesiastes 3.8, this is a time of war and hatred. The love for an enemy who approaches with a weapon involves making him go back. There's a place to fight against evil. Those who do not take weapons to fight, listen to this, he says, must take the spiritual weapons and fight in prayer. If there's nothing we can do, we can pray. I, I, I coined this phrase myself. I was looking at everything that's happened in Canada recently. It's not about protests with placards. It's about prayer with power. That's what's going to change hearts. That's what's going to move hearts. When God changes the heart, and he said, that's why he says, pray. Pray. There's power in prayer. We need to, we need to, we need to reestablish that faith in prayer, that it's not just a mundane, a traditional formality thing we do. When we gather Sunday morning, it's not formality. Come and pray, because we believe there's power in prayer. We're praying for our nations when we're, we gather. We're praying for the service. We're praying for one another. There's power in prayer, because what prayer is saying is, God, I trust you. If we don't pray, that means we're not trusting in God. We're trusting in ourselves. We're trusting in people, whatever. We need to pray. Fight in prayer. He goes on to say, interesting to watch, but disappointing to admit that we are far from the city now where the church was. This is the question. This is how he put it. If we don't have children, if we don't have a flock, if we don't have people gathering anywhere, can we still be called the church? This is what he said. The answer for today is clear. We are the church. He just wrote this a couple days ago. Our a Jerusalem-like church scattered all over the world. And if the Christians suffer from persecution and threat of destruction, then we are in the same situation because of war, also because of the threat of destruction. How long can we stay like this? Out in the open, no gathering. He says, pay attention to when looking for a church. A true church is always a gathering of people who preach the values of the gospel, sharing a sincere love for the Savior, Jesus Christ, and building up their lives, principles, and beliefs in the Word of God. That's the church. That's you and I. Values of the gospel. A royal church is one that serves the needy at all times. A true church is one where they love each other. Almost 24-7 live chats from different services and chats from the community in general. When the distance between us and so much ignorance uh, and so much ignorance so comforting this question from beloved brothers and sisters from around the world how are you and the royal church is the only one one on a mission to bring as many people as possible into a close and growing relationship with the lord the only ones in the value of loving serving and blessing we care and care for each other no matter what happens next. By the way, it's not the institution that makes us a church, but the Spirit of God and the teachings of Christ. So let's hold closer to the obedience to the Spirit and to the Word of Christ. Written by a pastor under great duress, 
and persecution. And they've come to that understanding. This is what's really important, is our rooting and grounding in truth in Jesus. Let's move on. Time is going here. The third one, so we, we, had, we had the purpose of God, kingdom, vision. We have the plan of God, or the plan of God, which is for us to understand the kingdom values. So we live by that so that we can portray that. And then the third word I want to leave with you is the process. Okay? The process. The third key. Establishing kingdom vision and kingdom values will result in kingdom culture. We can have an understanding of God's vision. We can under, have an understanding of the values. But if we don't live them out, we'll never demonstrate a kingdom culture. And that's what the world needs to see. They need some answers. Your, your people in your world need some answers. People in my world need some answers. I'm saying, Lord, help me to connect with people where I can give them some answers. Not only do we declare the gospel, but we can also demonstrate the gospel. Those two go on. Jesus went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. There was some action. There was some living it out. People saw. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good deeds. Not just hear your good words, but see your good deeds. And, and what? The result will, and they will glorify God in heaven. So the process. Colossians 2, verse 10. Got it up there? There we go. And you are in him, made full, and have come to fullness of life in Christ. You too are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and reach full spiritual stature. And he is the head of all rule and authority in every angelic principle and power. So what's the Scripture saying? As we have been given the fullness of Christ, the potential is in you and I. Where's your faith level? Do you believe that? The potential is in me. I can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I can speak a word of wisdom and guide somebody's life in a decision they have to make. I have the potential because Christ is in me. His heart beats within me. I can have compassion to the uncompassionable, to those that are ugly, sinful. I see people, I see some of these homeless, they're bound satanically. My heart grieves, and I pray. Every time I see this one man, I pray. I say, Father, I break those chains in the name of Jesus. I have confidence that He can do it. The process. God wants us to become Christ-like so we can do what He did and do greater things. For this is to happen in our world we need to change from our old ways of sin to new ways in God, from flesh to spirit. Don't walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. Galatians 5, read it. Get rid of these things that are in us by the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. We need to die to self, our routines, our traditions, our comfort zones, our selfishness, sometimes our own viewpoints. Humble us, Lord. It's through Christ that this is possible. Accepting Him is the beginning of the change from who we are to who we are to be, Christ-like. 2 Corinthians 5.7, I've already referred to it, from old to new. Don't stay the same. Don't stay what is old. Don't stay what is the same old me. No, God doesn't want you to be the same old you. He wants you to be the new Him on earth, reflecting Jesus. What's old is the sinful nature with all its fruit. What's new? The new nature in Christ with all its fruits. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, and I'll, I'll leave you this last part of the process. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in this attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holy. This scripture brings out a three-step process. Three step. Number one, and, and he puts the ball into our court. Oh Lord, change me. Oh, I want to be different. I don't want to be the old. Okay. All right, I'll change you. But here's what I'm going to instruct you to do. Number one, put off the old. 
Stop doing your former ways. Stop doing those things that you're not happy with. You know it doesn't please me. Stop it. I'll come alongside of you. I'll empower you by the Holy Spirit. I'll fill you to overflowing. I'll give you a heavenly language. When you don't know what to say, start speaking it. My spirit knows what you're saying, and your spirit knows what it's saying to me. Get in the Word. Study the Word. Understand the Word, and then do the Word. James 5, James 1 again. Don't just look into the Word and walk away, but look into it and do it. And putting off the old involves making a decision. Sometimes we don't like making decisions. A lifestyle dominated by selfishness leading to disobedience. is what That's the sinful nature. Romans says, don't let sin reign in you. Romans again says, let the sinful mind is hostile toward God's. Colossians 3 describes what all those sinful things are that come out. Colossians 3, 5 to 9. So he says, put those off. The second step in the three-step process in allowing the kingdom of God and the purpose of the church to develop within us is be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The seed of our intellect. I already referred to this. That's where all the decisions are made. That's why our minds need to be renewed, transformed by the renewing of our minds so we can determine what the perfect, acceptable will of God is for me. How am I to live out my life? How am I to live out the purpose of the church? I need, I need some mind renewal. I need some brainwashing. The washing of the water by the Word. Need to get in the Word because it's the Word that's going re, re, uh, 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 to, to change our thinking processes. What's in the heart, the most speaks. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Need to change to a value system that's pleasing to God based upon his principles. And change of heart involves dedication and discipline. Putting off was decision, being renewed, dedication and discipline, Colossians 3.10, and having clothed yourselves with a new spiritual self, which is ever in the process of being renewed and remolded into fuller and more perfect knowledge upon knowledge after the image, the likeness of him who created it. And it's done by the Word and by the Spirit. That's what is going to happen. Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones, it was the Word spoken and the wind that blew that out of confusion, out of death, came an identity. A mighty army stood up. Part of the army of God will be you and me need to be shaped by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit. And then the third, third one, he says, is to put on the new. A lifestyle of obedience. That's where it gets a little tough. Okay, my flesh is enmity with God. It opposes things that are godly. But I'm not going to be led by the Spirit. I, I'm not going to be led by the flesh, but I'm going to be led by the Spirit. A lifestyle of obedience, and that involves devotion. Romans 13, clothe yourself with Christ. Put on love. See, it's our responsibility. If we're going we're gonna to allow the process that God is working in us to do and wanting to do in us, we need, we need to humble ourselves. We need to reach out to Him. Lord, help us. So in conclusion... The great spiritual reset is happening in the church, I believe. God is resetting His church, getting us refocused. Understand His purpose. Understand His plan. Understand His process. Because there's work to be done, because the heart of God is that all men be saved. All we are called to do, I wrote this down, can be summed up in this statement. Our purpose is to defeat the work of the enemy. That's a big order. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And understand this. We can defeat the enemy. We can. Because the devil's scared of us. Do you believe that? He's scared of me. But he sends lies. Oh, you're no good. You're weak. You made these. I mean, he'll because he's going to do pull out all stops against his church to try and defeat the church. He's been doing that right from the beginning of time. He's trying to defeat the work of God. We need to. I need to step up my level of faith. Jesus defeated him at the cross, and through the work of the cross, the natural body. 
His victory, overcoming spirit, lives in us. So we now defeat the devil through Jesus as his spiritual body. Revelation says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, that's our faith, and we believe and love not ourselves unto death, meaning we're dead to sin but alive to righteousness. The purpose of the church. And I was reminded as I was summing this up in my heart, okay, Lord, the purpose of the church and all that I've said. I reminded him of an old song that we used to sing here. Remember David when he went to Ziglag after warring and he found the enemy had taken and stolen everything? And he was depressed, he was downcast, his soldiers wanted to kill him. But it says he was strengthened in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord. What did he do? He didn't hightail it out of there and woe was me, the enemy defeated him. No, he went to the enemy's camp and brought back that which the enemy stole. I was reminded of that song. I go to the enemy's camp. I went to the enemy's camp and took back that which he stole from me. And what's the last part of that song? He's under my feet. He's under my feet. He's under my feet. That's where the devil is. He's under our feet. So what has he stolen from you? As you heard the message, the purpose of the church. What has he stolen from you? Because he doesn't want you to fulfill the purpose. He wants to disrupt God's plan for you. And he wants to shut down the process that God has for you and working in you. Has he stolen from you your passion for God? Has he stolen peace? Has he stolen love? Has he stolen relationships? Has he stolen children? Has he stolen finances? What has he stolen? Don't succumb to his plans. Rise up in faith. Let your faith levels grow and rise up and stand upon God's Word, which reveals His plans for you, the church. We are living in tumultuous times. And God wants His church to rise up out of the ditch. He wants the, the tow truck of His Word to enlighten us, to rise up and say, okay, Lord, we're not going back to normal. I've had to change my thinking. Oh, God, I want to go. I want to see my family in Australia. Oh, by the way, I am going on Friday for four weeks. Lord, oh, you know. No, God's in control. I want his plans. And Lord, I want, to, I want to move forward in you. I hope that's your cry this morning. Lord, I want to move forward in you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love and mercy and grace. Thank you that we can call you Father by virtue of the blood of Jesus Christ that died upon the cross and saved us. We accepted that. Thank you. You are far greater than any man, any system. Lord, may our hearts be challenged afresh by your purposes by your plans, by your process for us, your church, because we are that vehicle on earth to demonstrate to the world your kingdom, a kingdom of hope, a kingdom of eternal life, a kingdom of peace and joy. We are to be that channels, those conduits, that pipeline. Help us to rise out of ourself. Help us to die to ourself. The Lord, you know, we need your Holy Spirit. We need a fresh move of your Holy Spirit. Not an emotional thing, but Lord, a deep, inner, working, changing, molding, shaping, transforming work of your Spirit. Lord, you said those that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. Lord, I pray that there will be a rise in our hearts to pray and to seek your face. To seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. As a church, Lord, as a local church, 
a community here. Lord, may the spirit of prayer descend upon us like never before. As we heard from this pastor in Ukraine, that's the weapon, the spiritual weapon that we can use that will outdo all weapons is a weapon of prayer. Help us to have those eyes of faith and understanding. Lord, as I said at the beginning, Lord, we put our ear to the ground to hear what's coming down. Not only in the evil way, but Lord, what are you doing by your Holy Spirit? We want to hear, as, as the writer of Revelations, John said, hear. Let those that have an ear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. Lord, may we hear today in Jesus' name. Amen.